Thank you for being here. Um, it's great to see so many businesses and we've got a, a wide variety here that's in the audience today. But we are celebrating Arizona Restaurant Week here. And so we are excited um, with our esteemed panel um, that you are gonna hear from today. So, and we're gonna get to hear from some latest industry trends. Also find out some secrets that may be coming to downtown Chandler. And so with Kim Moyer, so, and you'll get to hear from them in a little bit. But I'd also like to, um, um, today's program, like I said, it will be recorded and then everybody that's here will get a copy of that email to you. So this event would not be possible if it wasn't for our sponsors. And I do wanna do a shout out. We have Salt River Project, Alliance Bank of Arizona. Our supporting sponsors are Dignity Health Chandler Regional Medical Center, Intel, Catalyst Computer Technologies, Alliance Bank of Arizona, Wells Fargo, and SRP. Let's give them a round of applause. It is now my pleasure to introduce our 2022 board chair, Mr. Rick Cuman. Thanks, Terry. Thanks everybody for coming today. This is a great venue. Uh, if you haven't seen a movie down here, the staff does really a great job. Uh, it's a great place to take your family and stuff. Plus they also, I'm giving a plug for Majestic. They do rent these out just like we're doing right here. So uh, Steve Hewitt, who's a friend, is also great. So if you ever have a function you need to have, this is a great place for that as well and stuff. So um, I want to acknowledge some elected officials that are here in the audience. Christine's already waving her hand back there. So Christine Ellis is here. <laughs> Terry Rowe, I believe, is also Hi, back Sarah. here in the back row. So I guess I'm supposed to be closer to the microphone. And I think we had a couple other people, but I have not seen them yet. We do have Councilman uh, Stan's office on the on online, I believe, Terry. Yes. Right. Okay. Nice. So that's great. So, um, and now just it's my again. Thank you for coming, everybody. I think this will be a great thing to listen to. Kim and Jeff and, and Steve um, are all great to listen to uh, and give a lot of great knowledge. With that, I my pleasure to introduce uh, Mark Venezuela from the Salt River Project. To introduce today's speakers. Let me give you a little bit of an update on who Mark's all about here. Uh, <laughs> that's okay. He really wants to hear the program, that's why. Mark is a senior economic development um, project manager for Salt River Project in his capacity. Uh, Mark works with communities and regional partners to attract and expand businesses with SRP's service territory. He is nearly, um, has a nearly a decade of economic development experience. I know he doesn't look that old, but um, he is serving in several roles with the City of Mesa and Arizona State University. Um, Mark has also led to business retention and expansion activities, entrepreneurial in initiatives, business attraction, community engagement, and a variety of special projects. Projects. Mark is a graduate of ASU with a master's in public administration and a bachelor's degree in public service and public policy. He's an active member of the Arizona Association for Economic Development and is designated as an Arizona economic development professional. Welcome. Thanks so much, Terry. So just real quick, I'm happy to be here with you all today. As an avid Sunday bruncher, I'm looking forward to the <laughs> updates and recommendations from our speakers today. Um, I'm with SRP, and as many of you know, we have a long history of supporting economic development in Greater Phoenix uh, since our founding back in 1903. We're pleased to be a sponsor of this event as we always enjoy learning more about the latest growth and development across the valley. So on behalf of the SRP team, I'd like to thank the Chandler Chamber of Commerce for pulling all of this together. Now let's just get right into it. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce today's first speaker who will be joining us virtually, Representative Jeff Wenninger. Representative Wenninger is serving his fourth term for Legislative District 17. His district serves Gilbert, Sun Lakes, and a large portion of Chandler, where Jeff resides with his wife Janet and their three children. Before serving as a state representative, Jeff served on the Chandler City Council for eight years and held the position of vice mayor. He became known as a common sense councilman and created a culture that ultimately changed the way Chandler employees approach spending tax dollars. Chandler's budget remained one of the strongest in the state during the economic downturn and without cutting needed services. In addition, 
Representative Weininger is a restaurant owner who is very involved with the industry. Please join me, please join me in welcoming Representative Weininger. All right. Hello. How's everybody doing? Thanks for having me. Sorry I'm here virtually, but uh, every now and then we do work down here at the legislature. It hasn't been a whole lot lately, so uh, I'm here today. <clears throat> so I think a lot of you know me, Jeff Winninger. Uh, before I ran for city council, uh, I was still am in the restaurant business, but my full-time gigs was running Dilly's Deli and Floridino's Pizza and Pasta. Um, I'm still there quite a bit, so if you have something to complain about, you can just move me up to the bar and, uh, and find me pretty easily. Uh, I guess I'll just talk a little bit about uh, the restaurant industry in general right now and legislation that we have going through pertaining uh, to restaurants and those kinds of things. Um, <clears throat> You know, I'm the chairman of the Commerce Committee, which deals with all business issues, deals with banking issues, but deals with alcohol and uh, restaurant issues as well. Um, and so, you know, people are like, oh, but you're running things that uh, affect you, and there's a, a test for that, and I don't come anywhere near that. But uh, it's just common sense stuff, and a lot of times legislation comes from other people talking to other restaurant owners or business owners or constituents. And uh, sometimes it comes just uh, every now and then from something that you have seen yourself. So a few years ago, uh, I decided to finally tackle this kind of thing. I didn't understand why it was. And with investigating it, I, I figured it out. But basically to serve alcohol, not to drink, but to serve alcohol in Arizona until a few years ago, you had to be 19. Not 18, not 21, but 19, which was just a really weird, arbitrary age. That And so I investigated why this was so. And I remember when we first opened up Floridino's, we had a lot of underage servers. And we literally had to have a person of age constantly just running drinks because, you know, we had waiters, waitresses, and they couldn't do it. But as I think a lot of other restaurant owners or bar owners will say, they just wouldn't hire those people. And so it took a whole swath of people off the ability to be hired. And at the same time, someone's first year out of high school when they need money the most when they're going to college, they couldn't get a job waiting tables unless it was like a breakfast place or something. So we changed it back to 18. It was 19 because the drinking age in Arizona was 19 way back when, before the federal government blacked every, uh, blackmailed everybody with, uh, with highway funds, it was 19 because they didn't want high school seniors who had turned 18 buying beer for their friends who were 16 and 17. So that's why I was 19. So we changed that. Um, I'll talk about a couple bills that uh, I'm working on this year. <clears throat> One already passed, which is House Bill 2822. And this is lowering the personal property tax uh, to 2.5% overall. And the way, and it's a dramatic, decrease and uh, but with values and so many people moving in it won't really affect property taxes in general that people are collecting uh, it's dramatically going to help a lot of industries and we designed it in a way to do just that where we weren't just picking you know the intels which we're really happy to have but they have some very expensive equipment so this covers them but this also covers restaurants you go buy a new uh, $100,000 ovens and stuff, it's going to help out the restaurants and all their personal property. And it, it helps the farming community. And so it, it really helps everyone uh, over all these different stratas. And at the same time, it's just from, and Kim can probably talk about this, from the economic developers that were talking to us, it, it is just uh, something that we're kind of missing compared to other states. Uh, and now we just have this extra tool, which we really think it's just going to accelerate the uh, the uh, signings and the comings from out of state and the growth from within the state. And the last one is one we're voting on this week, which is uh, House Bill 2660. And it's typically known as the Liquor Omnibus Bill, uh, which I usually run. Um, I, I kind of get a rep running all these liquor bills, but it's just good policy. But uh, uh, this one, we're not calling it the liquor omnibus anymore. Somebody made that decision because there's a lot of, of uh, people who just vote against something if it's called an omnibus. So uh, 
little inside info. But one aspect of it that I thought was really interesting, and I was really thinking about uh, 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 new town square there across the street from City Hall when I put this in a few years ago, uh, somebody approached me, it was a Vestar in them, to come up with this ability where you could serve alcohol in these large 500,000 square feet and above shopping centers with certain security protocols and approvals in place where people could walk throughout, say, Desert Ridge with drinks or uh, uh, Tempe Marketplace or out in Glendale. And so that had passed on a trial basis and it had worked out. You have to have security and get approval and everything. And so this year when they brought it back to me to make it permanent, I said, well, what about the smaller guys? What, what about, and I was thinking exactly of a cross street from uh, City Hall where you have, you know, you got your steakhouse on one side, you have your Nashville restaurant on the other side, you have a natural stage as a barrier, but everybody's just kind of stuck on the patios and can't em enjoy that engagement. So we went ahead and, and, and expanded it to them as well. And then a, a Democrat on my committee, Diego, Diego Espinosa, who also owns restaurants, said, well, what about even the smaller guys? And so with really tight security protocols, you know, if someone had just a, a, a parking lot, but they knew that they were gonna have six events a year, Cinco de Mayo, Fourth of July, and different things, they could go ahead and get this approval from the city and from uh, the Department of Liquor. And then they, they would have a protocol plan that they'd have to follow like barriers and different things that they, that they would have to erect. But it would just make it a lot more efficient to have these special events a few times a year uh, instead of going in and getting a license for it every time. So uh, excited to hopefully get that passed. Um, state of the restaurant industry is, is good, but with a lot of troubles. I mean, at, at least with my places, we're very busy and that's a good problem to have, but we can't hire enough staff right now to keep up with it. We're out of items constantly, even with three different purveyors uh, trying to uh, keep up with products. So a lot of times we have substitute products and we're just out of certain things. And we've had some of the, uh, you know, we had a really big uh, industry partner who was one of our purveyors who told us when the supply chain kind of stuff started last year that they were just, that they couldn't service us anymore. And they weren't servicing us or, you know, other smaller places. They were just going to, for the, the big, you know, great money. And they told my manager this and they said something to the effect of, well, you know, when things calm down, we'll, we'll start serving you again. And luckily he, he said exactly what I would have said was uh, that no, they won't be ever servicing us again. And uh, we will make it our life's mission to never have to buy from them again, because that's what happens in, in certainly uh, these different parts of the industry is you run into these issues and I guess I just want to have some people realize if they don't realize that that it's much tougher for the smaller independents and the mom and pops, the little taco place you go down, you know, uh, somewhere, you know, Warner and Amish school, whatever. It's very, it's a lot tougher for them to keep up because they're the first ones that a purveyor cuts. Um, they're the ones who have a tougher time dealing with regulations. One thing that I'm really proud of is that when I was on city council, restaurant owners and people knew that I was the go-to guy if they were running into issues with, uh, you know, development or staff. And our, our staff is great uh, in Chandler, but there were times <laughs> where there just seemed to be, you know, uh, decisions being made that, that, that didn't make any sense. Uh, Jolie's place, which is a great place. I've never been there. You know, it's a bar atmosphere, but, but they, uh, they have great food, really good craft food uh, over there in, uh, in North Chandler. And they didn't like something that they were going to do with their, their patio gating. And they shut the entire job down. And I can't tell any staff member to do anything, but I basically said, you know, I'm not telling you what to do, but does it make sense to shut down the whole job? They lose a month of construction. They probably negotiated for free rent and, and you're putting them behind the eight ball on that. You don't have to give them a, a certificate of occupancy if they're not up to where you want, but let them keep constructing while you, while you do that. And, and staff did. And, you know, I tried to do whatever I could during with different people, the perch and sidelines and, uh, Time is, is money, especially to these smaller people. And so uh, I, I'm proud of the fact that I helped uh, do that. 
Another thing I would caution, and this is probably a controversial topic for some of the people in the room, but one thing that I'm telling restaurant owners about is that the minimum wage is going to go up dramatically January 1 again. So right now it's uh, 12.80. It went up, I think, 80 cents or 75 cents this last time. If a snapshot is taken today, it would go up a dollar five. So most likely it's definitely going to 1385. And I know a lot of people say, well, that's great. And I can tell you, you can go ask my employees. I mean, we are, we pay very well, probably as much or more than uh, most chains do. Um, but I have more scale than a lot of smaller mom and pops that you might like around town. And the, their price, they're going to 1385. All their costs are going for food costs and supply chain and fuel uh, that is so expensive now is all skyrocketing on them as well. And what do you think's gonna, it's just, what do you think's gonna happen to their prices? They're, they're gonna have to raise their prices. I don't know, sometimes the city and them like that because they collect more sales tax and they're collecting more tax on, on the people who have the, you know, the wages raised. And, you know, we obviously uh, do and need to, to uh, pay as much as, as people can, but at some point, I mean, reality takes over. I mean, that it's just going to increase inflation in Arizona and, and cost of everything uh, more and more. So I, I am uh, telling my fellow restaurateurs that and, uh, because they need to start planning for that now because that, that's gonna be a, a huge uh, amount of money. And with compaction, you're raising the other people as well too. So. Um, I don't know where I'm at on time. All right. Representative Weniger, can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Thank you for that. I, that was kind of a downer that you ended on because you have done some great work there, but it is reality. Um, can you talk a little bit? You were very instrumental, especially with some of our brew pubs on getting some of the limits um, on how much they can um, manufacture. Um, and getting some of those raised. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? I'm sorry, can you repeat that one more time? About our brew pubs. Um, you were instrumental a couple of years ago that on um, getting the limits on what they could actually produce, um, raising that limit for them. Can you for hear me? alcohol providers? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we've had some different changes in, in these different things where, you know, when I, my first year in was the beer bill and, and dramatically uh, in uh, increasing that, there was a huge fight. I, uh, there's big fights with water down here and there's big fights with alcohol. You want to talk about one of the toughest uh, industries and lobby groups is the alcohol because you certain people have built in advantages in the way the table's set right now, so they don't want any changes. So when the microbrew or industry uh, changed that. It was, and you've seen an explosion <laughs> since then of, of their growth and how much that they're producing. Uh, there was a big fight on that. Everybody came together on the end, in the end. The next fight, there was a couple uh, more fights that are kind of going on, but I think it's really important. And what is the wine industry? And I would just tell everyone, uh, and, and no disrespect to Coca Pelle, which used to be in downtown Chandler, but the wine industry has dramatically changed since then. And it is really amazing. If you have not been down to Sonoida in Southern Arizona, please take a trip. If you have not been to Cottonwood and Cornville and uh, Jerome lately, and that whole Verde Valley, please get up there. I mean, downtown Cottonwood is one of my favorite places in the state of Arizona. You can literally walk up and down a three block area and probably have 15 different places where you can do a wine tasting and it's really good wine um, and so i ran a bill to try to loosen up certain things on them i've been successful on a couple smaller things but they're really uh, uh have a lot of blockage with how much that they can produce uh and, and they really hit a ceiling there's there's a couple small little places that by no means you go up there in, in Cottonwood and surrounding areas where there's just some barrens of wine or anything. These are just small mom and pops, but they're hitting their limits. And essentially after they hit the limit, they have to send everything 100% through 
through a distributor, which essentially adds eight, six to eight dollars a bottle of wine, and it just doesn't even make any sense. So people stay artificially small on purpose so they don't have to. And you can go say hi to you know uh, Maynard Keenan up there, who's one of the, the good ones, uh, really good winemakers who I've gotten to know. He's the lead singer of Tool, and uh, he's building a magnificent new place in downtown Cottonwood up on this berm should be open later this year and another real quick thing that I wasn't successful because of the strength of part of the liquor lobby this year was something I ran a bill on things called RTDs ready to drinks so if you think about it a Mike's Hard Lemonade <laughs> or a White Claw is an RTD but they manipulate the formula these out you know these corporations from out of state they manipulate the formula to where it technically is a beer and so that beer imagine you have a a six pack say a six pack is a gallon and then you have a six pack of mike's hard lemonade and then you have a six pack of one that is made with alcohol with spirits but it has 12 percent or below alcohol content the beer one is is charged 16 cents a gallon the spirits one which essentially is the same product is three dollars a gallon and it's just patently unfair and of course you know everybody lobbies up and hires all the lobbyists to preserve their absolute advantage and and uh, step up on the ladder through the tax code and it just it, it doesn't make any sense unfortunately i uh i, I couldn't be beat them back this year well, we appreciate your efforts and everything that you're doing, and thank you so much for joining us, um, and keep up that hard work and fighting for business down there at the Capitol. So thank you so thank much. You. All right. Mark, do you want to introduce our next speaker? Sure. Uh, next up, we have Kim Moyers, Cultural Development at the City of Chandler. Kim has been in the Valley for 16 years and has worked in downtown development and redevelopment for over 25 years. As a downtown redevelopment manager in Chandler for the last five years, she has actively expanded the downtown area, creating an urban environment to work, do business, and be entertained, while continuing to pay respect to the Chandler downtown past. In 2019, Kim became the Cultural Development Department Director, overseeing the Chandler Center for the Arts, Vision Gallery, Chandler Museum, Special Events, and Downtown Redevelopment. Kim? You. I have to admit, when I was asked to give a 15-minute presentation on all of the downtown restaurants, I don't think I've ever been more excited to give a presentation before. So I have some notes here because I could talk for an hour. Um, so um, I decided to name this the top 10 reasons to go to downtown. But I have a game for us to play. So you all have a pen and some paper. What I'd like for you to do is grab that and start tallying as I go through all the list of different places in the downtown. Tally it at the end, we'll see who our downtown champion is, okay? All right. <laughs> I don't know if this is gonna be a good one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here we go. Um, the most a uh, common question that I get asked is, I have friends and family in town, where should I take them? So number one on my list of taking vi to visitors is the Perch. The Perch has to come to top of mind because of the unique atmosphere. Its newly renovated upstairs patio has lots of shade to enjoy uh, <laughs> one of their craft beers and includes a stage for live music. Rebe Rebecca's Rescue Birds takes center stage and is a kid's favorite. You'll also notice downtown Chandler's um, music scene has really been growing in popularity. So you'll find a little music note as to all the places that have live music in the downtown. Next one is uh, Santan Brewery, is arguably uh, downtown's um, uh, champion for resurgence. Their craft beer can be found throughout the downtown area, throughout the city, throughout the state, throughout the country and uh, is a, definitely a local hangout. People get excited when they find out that Santan is actually in downtown Chandler. Serrano's. Serrano's is the oldest 
continuously owned and operated family business in Chandler, celebrating over a hundred years in Chandler. Serrano's Mexican restaurants have been in downtown Chandler since the 1970s. And recently opened Recreo is the perfect choice for those playful at heart. They have lots of lawn games, rope swings at the outside bar, an elevated shipping container for DJing, and they even have etch-a-sketches for those creatives. It's also very family friendly. Next on the list would be take go to downtown for date night. The Hidden House is a dream date with all of their twinkle lights, amazing food, and attention to detail. But make sure you make reservations in advance if you want to get in. They oftentimes are, are filled up for the night. Another local favorite is DC Steakhouse. They expanded into New Square in 2020. And if you sit outside in their fire tables listening to music on the stage, it makes for one special night. La Ristra, New Mexican food is out of this world. Just make sure you don't get into a fight for not wanting to share your chips with them. They have lots of TVs to watch a game at the bar and live music to enjoy on their extra large patio. And who doesn't like a um, movie and, and dinner? Um, you can accomplish both of these at Look Cinemas with their extra cushy seats. You'll in and let the food come to you. Next is Downtown Sounds. The distillery broke into downtown Chan Chandler and has quickly became a favorite place to dance. They bring in live artists from Nashville and their pizzas are amazing. West Alley Barbecue. Just look at that picture. I think that says it all. If you've ever been fortunate enough to meet Mr. Dandy, you will fall in love in about 2.5 seconds. And he takes great pride in, in preparing the barbecue for you. West Alley also brings in local blues that will make you want to stay and have another drink. Murphy's Law knows how to throw a party, especially on St. Patrick's Day. Their live music fills the place up on Friday and Saturday nights. Um, and Bourbon Jack's is a country lover's destination. They also have my number one favorite mac and cheese dish. And if you've had it, it will be your number one too. Next, come to downtown for girls night. Black Sheep is also becoming one of the number one choices for many. For wine lovers in the room, their house wine is only $5 a glass and it is delicious, or so I'm told. Crust expanded and redesigned their outdoor patio space, making it perfect to catch up, carb up, and people watch. And Craft 64 has a front patio, but many don't realize that there's a back patio, and that's the one that really blows me away. All of their food is made from scratch. It's organic and local. If we have a girl's night, we gotta have a guy's night. So get yo taco. I've heard more than one conversation that says that Get Yo is the place to go after having a drink or two in the downtown. <laughs> Their mural, see you've heard it too, have you not? Their mural and outdoor seating is a great way to spend the night. Petal House Brewery is well known for their award-winning craft beer, but it's their Bavarian pretzel with beer cheese that's my personal favorite. Okay, Puro does not serve food, but this is a guy's night, so I had to include the cigar bar into this experience. If you know Pat, you know this is where you go to have a good time. And the local is the place to go to watch your favorite sports team. Their indoor-outdoor space makes it a sports enthusiast must-go place to hang out for the day. Next is our international flavors. Charm Thai is a popular spot for downtown employees. Their quick service and hot delicious food make it easy to go to lunch. It makes it easy to go to lunch there. And East Wind Sushi is a great way to try new foods with their conveyor belt that provides a variety of options at only $2.50 a plate. This is my, my son's number one place that he likes to take me to. Inchins Bamboo has activated the east side of Arizona Avenue. Their Asian fusion foods are beautifully presented and the restaurant features Asian art to enjoy. And Jenya Ramen at New Square will be your favorite go-to spot for all things ramen. 
They have amazing vegetarian and gluten-free options as well. And who hasn't heard that brunch is now the new Saturday night, right? That's the first thing we said is we like to brunch on Sunday. So um, anyone who's been around Chandler for a while knows that downtown uh, Chandler Cafe has a cult following. They are quite busy during breakfast and lunch, but, it's the, but their addition of a back patio has made room for all to enjoy. The Tipsy Egg just opened. This is on this, the southeast corner of Boston Street and Arizona Avenue. We are quite excited for this. It's been worth the wait. Their twist to breakfast and lunch items are sure to make this a new hot spot for you to enjoy brunching. And Over Easy had me with their sweet potato tater tots, my personal favorite. I love their bright energy and yummy foods that really get you going for the day. Lunchtime, uh, we have Chiba Hut, uh, another cult favorite with lunch options and sizing for all. It's a great place to hang out and chill. The original Chop Shop is perfect for the health conscious and although their food tastes so good, you'll forget that it's good for you. Uh, their acai bowls are my personal favorite and it's on my lunchtime rotation. And I have not seen if Moffin's here, but is Moffin here? All right, if there's anyone who hasn't fallen in, in love with Moffin and her cheese. You go to Mingle and Grace to see that beautiful smile and the amazing food is just an added bonus. And Trulin Burgers have grass-fed, homemade free beef, and they are heavenly, but it's their buns that make you remember to keep carbs in your life. So don't skip here, eat the bun. All right. We are now up to drinks. You guys know, if the ones who know me know that I love downtown and I am a champion, uh, but you don't have to just eat down here. You can also drink down here. And I do have a favorite. I have an addiction. And many of you have caught me walking down Arizona Avenue for my afternoon mango passion fruit tea at Shared Tea. Out of fairness to all the others, I'll leave it there, but if you go and you try it, and you should, please give me a call and I'm happy to meet you there. Kaleidoscope juice is a life changer if you are cleansing or trying to get more um, uh, fruits and vegetables in your diet. Their tasty drinks make you wanna be a healthier person. And Pichotto coffee, I don't think I need to say much more here. Julia has changed all of our minds about how you drink coffee and we thank her for it daily. If you want to see the who's who in Chandler, just visit Peixoto on any day of the week. And Black Rock just recently opened and has people buzzing. Their cool vibe make it a great afternoon option for a drink. But now for the real drinks. The Ostrich, the, court, the Courthouse, the Spirit House, and the Sleepy Whale are all known for a quick stop to begin your evening or a nightcap to conclude it. On the weekends, many of them have live music. <laughs> And I can't fish, finish without mentioning downtown sweets. Not only can you buy your favorite piece of pie at Pie Snob, you can create your own whole pie by choosing all of your favorites in one pie plate. Screamery is another great option to end your night. Their sweet cream honeycomb is not only award winning, but may change your mind on your favorite flavor of ice cream. And yes, Divine Gourmet, it is a retail place, but their homemade caramels and turtles are perfect to eat while you're walking along the colonnade or to take home to your babysitter. And with that, let's see who our champion is. Okay, I'll give you a second to tally up. We had a total of 42 that I mentioned. How many of you have had at least 30? Been to 30 of the places? Pretty good, 35? 35, oh. do we have one? Thir uh, yeah. 36? So 35 is it? Let me see no. your 35s. I have been oh, to every oh, wait, single wait, wait, one wait, of wait. them. I forgot, <laughs> I, 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 I had in my notes to mention, Terry is uneligible for this. <laughs> I, I saw 36, or 35s. I don't think I saw any 36s. Who's a 35? We got one, we got two, we got three. Those are the three prizes I have. So. All right, there you go. Thank you very Kim, much. Kim, don't go anywhere. I want to ask you a couple of questions. Um, so you have done a phenomenal job about driving density, because we can't just talk about, I know it's restaurant week, and um, this is 
all exciting, but we need to keep those restaurants busy. Yes. I want you to talk about, from an economic development standpoint, how critical that is to build the mass in downtown. Mass is extremely important, um, and, and mass can come in different ways. It can come through office, your, our daytime mm -hmm. users, those are the people that come at lunch uh, and breakfast and afternoon tea, like myself. Um, and it also comes in the form of multifamily, people who live down there, and that is the place where they are going to be entertained, and that's where they're going to eat. And you can talk to any business uh, in the downtown throughout the country, and they'll tell you that that mass is critical to their survival. It helps re recession-proof a lot of these restaurants. And we were extremely fortunate during COVID. We did not lose a single restaurant, and a lot of that is because uh, we stayed open and we do have some of that multifamily. We have a lot of multifamily coming and I think that that's going to um, help um, bring additional business into Chandler and continue to help us grow. There, there are features in a downtown that we're still looking for. One of the questions I get all the time is we really need it like a local grocer, someplace like a Lucy's. And I think that would be amazing. And we've been trying for years, but the number one thing that they tell us is there's just not the critical mass that there yet. So we'll continue to increase those densities and um, keep our existing businesses healthy and continue to strive for new great options for people to uh, experience. How many new units, um, housing units, are coming in on the market um, in downtown? So under construction right now, we have almost 400. We have um, Encore that's just on the east side of uh, the downtown, and we have DC Heights. Um, and then we have um, a couple more that will be coming in for rezoning, and we'll see how that goes, but that could be a couple hundred more. And then DC Heights is only doing phase one. We have a phase two, and that should be about another 110 units. Okay. And then um, talk a little bit about the city, what you're doing from just from Fry Road down, because that we're starting to see a resurgence in some of the things that are happening. Yeah. She downtown. does a lot of amazing things, but I have to pull it out of her. <laughs> downtown um, is amazing. And you know what? When we talk about the downtown, I appreciate um, all of the, the positive feedback we get since my tenure here. But these were all decisions that were made literally 20, 30 years ago. And they've just got this great, um, we've had this great resurgence in the last 10 years or so. And when I very first started eight years ago, and I would talk to different developers and entrepreneurs, if they could not be underneath the colonnade, they just simply weren't interested in coming. And we knew that the only way that we could get people to expand is to prove that there was a, a proven market. So it w was with projects like New Square, you know, that all of a sudden that gap between the historic square and where the perch is, that didn't seem like such a, a far walk all of a sudden when there's Genya and a and great stage there and um, uh, DC Steakhouse. So people started really gravitating towards the South. Then through our adaptive reuse project, we've been able to take a lot of the, um, we have a lot of like tire shops and automotive shops in the downtown. We've been able to convert those into some restaurants. So all of a sudden, there is no space available in the downtown and the developers know if they wanna be a part of Chandler, they're gonna to have to go to the South. So a couple years ago, we um, uh, council approved funding to finish Arizona from Fry Road down to Pecos and we uh, widen the sidewalks and we put the great lighting in and we put some pedestrian features in to continue that redevelopment into the south and lo and behold that's exactly what's happening so we will continue to feed and and expand what we can in the core but a lot of that's going to be maintenance issues now and how we how we um, place make that area. When we talk about new development, most of the new development will all be south of Fry in the future. Good. Open it up to questions from the audience. And Vice Mayor. You know, I always have questions about the downtown. Yes, sir. <laughs> sorry, you want me to do the mic thing? Yeah. Okay, so you were here and you heard uh, Representative Weninger talk about activating spaces for, uh, and, and, and you know what I'm gonna ask about, right? The park? Yes. And so are we gonna be able to try and really make that a little bit more of an area where restaurant 
churchgoers can go out and enjoy and take some wine and yeah. have a beverage? Yeah, uh, Councilman Brewer, that would be wonderful, and we, we will encourage that in, in every way that we can. Um, so during uh, what we were talking about is um, the ability to have wine and beer in, in uh, Dr. A.J. Chandler Park, which would really um, encourage that pedestrian feeling and keep people there longer. Uh, during COVID, there were many, um, many things done at the state level that actually allowed for some flexibility. And we were able to designate Dr. A.J. Chandler Park to have beer and wine in there. And at a time when you couldn't go into restaurants, um, it was wonderful because you could go and get takeout and get a beer or a wine and safely and responsibly drink in the park. And it, was, it has been very successful. Because of that, we've had a lot of business owners and, um, and others who are interested in trying to make that permanent. So that is something that we will continue to try to work with any legislation that we can to talk about what the benefits of that are. Um, obviously, that comes with more policing, um, but what we found so far is that people have been extremely responsible in those parks. Vacancy rates within downtown, because I think that that's important to talk about. Office? We, uh, office is uh, less than 5%. Less than 5%. Less than by, in the, in the, the that, that's unheard of in any other community. And um, retail, we have, I mean, nothing. Retail, there's nothing. We have to build it so yep. that they build come. It, they will come, that's right. And, um, and then housing, everybody knows there's a housing shortage and we're, we're not any different to that, especially yeah. within the downtown area. Absolutely, and I know that, um, you know, that it gets outside of my area a little bit, but I do know that um, our council is taking that very seriously and are looking at some affordable options. So I think that, you know, I don't know when that will happen, but I know that um, they're they're taking strong looks at that and working with neighborhood resources. Well, and I do have to do a shout out to you and your team and mayor and council because of that strategicness in helping to rebuild that downtown area. I know that you're focusing south, but because of that, we're also seeing some positive things happen up in just north of here, um, Chandler Boulevard. Yes. Yes. Um, the Aloha um, Motel, which used to be by the hour, which is now a really high-end Airbnb. Yeah. Um, we did a ribbon cutting there um, just not too long ago. That was a city project. Mm -hmm. um, the Coyote Bar is gone, yay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you're seeing all kinds of, um, it's all fenced off and you're seeing some new things happen there. The Casablanca Motel up there Absolutely. is now changed. And yeah. so we, we have these arbitrary lines that say what downtown is, but most certainly when, when uh, developers come in and they're on the outskirts of downtown, they will tell you that they're in downtown or the proximity to downtown is why they're building where they are because it is walkable and it is, um, you can do multimodal opportunities. Final question, because you're, you're doing all these things from the housing and building that density, talk a little bit about all of the parking spaces <laughs> as well as some of the new signage and things that are happening. The mayor would be furious at me if he knew I did not talk about Chandler and free parking because we do have lots of parking in downtown. And I always appreciate the opportunity to talk about it because um, you know, the downtown has continued to grow and we're not a suburban little downtown anymore that you should expect to park right in front of the business. We have, I just named 42 different places. That doesn't count any other uh, retail that we have down there. You're not, it, the likelihood that you park right in fr front of your destination is really small. So we have five parking garages. Our parking garage, the Oregon Street parking garage, has another 930 spaces. Our Overstreet garage has 350 spaces on the west side. And then on the east side, we have about another almost 1,500 parking spaces. So between that and the surface parking, we have well over 3,000 spaces and um, uh, we are trying to draw people to that. So if you as a downtown champion could help us out in any way, it's drawing those people to the parking garages. Why keep your car out in the hot sun when you can be in, in shade and um, help us out there a little bit? One, did you have a question? It was about parking. <laughs> All right, yeah, see, it's I was reading your mind there. Um, other questions for Kim? Yes, last question. 
first off, I want to say, even though Kim is a tiny little woman, I know she's eaten at every one of those places because I've seen her there. So um, <laughs> that is not that is very true. Any any um, comment maybe on what to expect for downtown or what those downtown businesses can expect during the summer, especially as they're all recovering and all of those things. It seems so vibrant and busy now. Yes. But I know we want to keep supporting them because yeah. they are so local. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a really great question. Um, you know, in Arizona, they most of the restaurants have to make enough money in the good months to survive the summer months. There's no doubt about that. However, what we have found is that our shoulder season keeps getting longer and longer. We've done uh, a lot of marketing efforts with the, with the Downtown Chandler Community Partnership, such as your Bacon Me Crazy and uh, the um, Sipping Santas that, that really expand our season and makes that summer difficult months a little more narrow. Um, I wish Gavin J Jacobs was here. He was telling me once in August, which is the hottest month, right? It was his busiest month yeah. of the year. Yeah. And that should be your slowest. So I think that that goes to show, build it and they will come. People are still eating. We may not see them walking and meandering and you know sitting outside as much. You, you, may, you may look at the patios because we have these amazing patios in downtown and there may not be as many people out there, but when you go into the businesses, they're staying pretty busy. So the answer to that is marketing and making sure that we have a great product. I say this all the time. I mean, I am a ch champion for downtown, but it's only because it's so easy to do. Um, these are local business owners. The owner of these businesses are the ones greeting you when you come in and there's something very special about that and I think people can feel it and it keeps them coming back for more. All right, well thank you. Kim, I do wanna do a shout out. Juicy Mike's opens today in okay. downtown. Yeah, I thought that was gonna be your number one question is what's coming next. Yeah, well. So Jersey Mike's today, we have Uncommon that's gonna be here in, the, in a late june early july that's going to be um, a music venue with some video games then we have a mediterranean restaurant called aqua de mar that's going to open up and i'm super excited about that we're hoping that for by the end of the summer and we have another steakhouse coming in downtown yeah we do so stay more tuned. to come you yes. have to stay tuned so yeah. thank you kim thank mark you. Thanks, Kim, that was great. Our final speaker of the day is the Arizona Restaurant Association President and CEO, Steve Chukri. Steve is a quintessential American story. A native of Mesa, Arizona, he comes from Lebanese lineage on both sides of his family. His maternal grandfather, Tony M. Corey Sr., was a true entrepreneur in becoming the first licensed automobile dealer in Arizona. Steve draws inspiration from his grandfather, who couldn't read or write, but whose hard work and success afforded Steve firsthand insight into the complexities of running a business. That experience at an early age led to successful careers in both the public and private sectors. Of the many jobs Steve has today, he would say that the most important is that of a devoted father to his two young sons and loving husband to Christine, his wife of 20 years. For the past 18 years, Steve has served as the president and CEO of the Arizona Restaurant Association, leading an organization that promotes dining out as a perfect fit for Steve, who has scorched so many diners, he has begun to wonder if burnt was a food group. <laughs> Steve was elected to serve as a Maricopa County Supervisor for District 2 and held office from 2013 to 2021. Steve championed to eliminate excess regulations and create an environment that invites innovation and sustains entrepreneurial growth with a best-in-class mindset. Recently, Steve was appointed to the Republic of Estonia uh, to be the Honorary Consul for Arizona. Join me in welcoming Steve. I'm horrible at PowerPoints, but just the arrow, right? Yes, sir. So first I wanna congratulate Terry and Molly for the great job they do. Uh, when I was a county supervisor, I did not get to take in uh, Chandler, so this is a real treat for me uh, to be here, and it's, it's great to, to see all of you. Ma fam, fam, I'm gonna mess up your name, and I'm Lebanese, and I'm gonna mess up your name. Uh, you've done events at my home, I take full credit for your work, I just want you to know. Uh, and if I can, for a quick second, uh, Terry, I, in the intro, 
Uh, I've got a great Chandler story uh, because my grandfather, as you heard uh, in my intro, uh, was actually born here uh, in Marinci, Arizona, uh, which was a small little mining town a year before statehood. Uh, and he was taken back to Lebanon as an infant. And then when he was 13, uh, he came here uh, through Mexico with my great grandfather. Uh, they turned my great grandfather away and said, you're not a US citizen. Said to my grandfather, you are. Uh, let him in, and my great-grandfather handed my uh, grandfather $5 and said, you're on your own, good luck. And so he was homeless, he worked and sold dry goods in uh, Miami Globe area, which was a huge, booming mining town. And a friend of his said, Tony, I am looking for a car to buy. My budget's $50, you're out on the streets all the time. If you see one, would you let me know? Sure enough, my grandfather sees one. $50. He goes, finds the same shoe polish, puts a one in front of the five, and says it's $50 down and $100 later. Sold a car that was never his. Made $100. <laughs> so he goes to his good friend and he says, you know, I like this car business. I think I'm going to move down to the valley uh, and I'm going to start a car business. And he said, Tony, I'm right behind you. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm in the produce business. And his name was Eddie Basha Sr. Uh, and so Eddie Basha Sr. and my grandfather, Tony Corey Sr., were best friends. My grandfather went into business in 1928, uh, and Eddie Basha and the Basha family went into business in 1932. Uh, so I just had lunch with Ike Basha a few weeks ago and showed him uh, a family photo at my parents' wedding uh, with his dad and his grandfather as the best man at my parents' wedding. So anyway, meaningless trivia, but you learned something today. So let's talk about, uh, whoops, the restaurant industry. Uh, it's a three-legged stool. Uh, we've been around since 1939. Uh, we educate, advocate, and collaborate. What do, what do I mean by educate? People have got to be trained on how to properly handle food in the kitchen. So we offer training classes on proper food handling, uh, and, and we do that two times uh, a month uh, in our offices. We advocate, you heard uh, Representative Winnegar talk about uh, to-go alcohol, that's a perfect example of some of the things we do. We'll get to that a little later. And then collaborate, obviously we do uh, restaurant week, which we're in right now. How many of you have gone to out this week? All right, that's good. But there's a great story with that too. Uh, and so we collaborate, and that's some of the things we do with our, our annual awards dinner at Foodist, uh, where we celebrate uh, Arizona's best and finest restaurateurs. Uh, these are some of the things that we are we put out by way of products. ProStart is something where we have a competition every year, then we send students to a national competition, uh, and that is, Today and tomorrow's young chefs, kids who are going through high school, learning how to properly handle food, properly cook food, and uh, that's something that we're very proud of and very much in need of uh, these days. Uh, moving on, uh, of course, we have our advocacy where uh, that press conference is during COVID uh, with Governor Ducey uh, when restaurants were having to get uh, shut down because of the spread of COVID. Uh, and so each and every day is something new uh, in the restaurant industry, and that's a big part of what we do. ARA 360 events is something that is relatively new. Um, a few years ago, people were coming to me, nonprofits, saying, hey, we're tired, and this isn't a dig on hotels, but we're tired of going to a hotel and getting a rubber chicken. We want to do something that's more economical. Uh, and so we have a space where we utilize uh, over at Republic Beverage, and we can seat 350 people. And what that is, is you come to me, let's say that Terry comes to me and says, Steve, we want to do an event that's unique and different. I say to Terry, okay, well, who do you want? Do you want Ruth's Chris? Do you want Ajo Owls? Do you want Serrano's? Who do you want to cater? And we marry Terry with the restaurant and we hold the event. And we've been very, very successful. And then COVID-19 hit. So we're still having to get those groups back, but that's been something that's been very great. Now, of course, these are just golf tournaments, restaurant week. So I am hitting my 20th year uh, this month as the president and CEO uh, of the Restaurant Association. I'm 50, for those of you who think I'm older. Uh, and I had uh, the, uh, basically American Express was a very, very big proponent of restaurant weeks around the country. And they came in for five years and they said, we want you to produce a restaurant week here. And we kept saying no. The environment wasn't right. And restaurant weeks don't always, aren't always successful. In the sixth year, I said, yes, we're ready. 
and it was very, very successful. And so restaurant week became a phenomenon. We have about, in our fall restaurant week, 150 to 180 restaurants that participate. Spring, everyone wanted to have a second one. I didn't think the, the environment was right. We started with 20 restaurants. This week, we've got 135 restaurants participating. And as Kim said, it's a shot in the arm for, for restaurants going into summer and restaurants coming out of summer with fall restaurant week. I was born and raised here. We really didn't have seasons back in the 70s and 80s in Arizona. We had two kinds of food in Arizona. We had Mexican food, and then we had a different kind of Mexican food. <laughs> the culinary diversity of Arizona today is unparalleled. Maple and Ash, how many of you have heard of that steakhouse in Scottsdale? This is the first footprint outside of Chicago, but they, they chose Arizona. Arizona is becoming more and more popular because we're economical, one. Two, we're a melting pot for so many people coming from all over the country deciding to live here. These are some sales. So how many of you, take a guess, what do you think total restaurant sales in Arizona were last year? Okay, I'll tell you. 15 billion with a B. Restaurant sales in the United States this year are slated to hit $1 trillion. Wow. $1 trillion. We are the largest economic engine in the state. We're bigger than state government. We employ 340,000 people in the state, excuse me, 240,000 people in the state. Now, when COVID hit, I got a call the first week in March from my counterpart in Boston, Massachusetts. And he said, buckle up, it's coming. I said, what's coming? He said, a shutdown. I just sat with my governor. This is getting worse and it's gonna eventually spread to your state and to the coast. Two weeks later, I found myself in negotiations with Governor Ducey on the very same thing. Our daily payroll in the Arizona restaurant industry during COVID, within a 48 hour time period, went from 14 million per day to two. We laid off 80% of our workforce in a matter of 48 hours. I had grown restaurateurs that you see proudly on TV coming into my office crying. What are we gonna do? We lost $2.5 billion that year alone in a thousand restaurants across the state of Arizona. I did more TV interviews that year than I did my entire, at that point, 18 year career as a CEO of this industry. So it decimated us. Very, very hard. What did we do? We took the Restaurant Week platform. How many of you are familiar with the Restaurant Week platform where you go to ArizonaRestaurantWeek.com, you can see the menus. We took that platform and we uploaded 750 menus of restaurants across the state for you to go and we pushed takeout weeks to go and dine out. Takeout for a restaurant represents 5% of their sales. After COVID, it now represents 25%. So think of that. Restaurants are, think of it as, as just a living and breathing entity organ. You can't just shut it down. And that's what people didn't understand during COVID. You don't just shut down certain things because you can't turn it back on. Your staff will leave your equipment will fail, your distribution lines will fail. So when Governor Ducey introduced to-go cocktails, that was a huge hit. Then a judge struck it down and said it's unconstitutional. And said you have until five o'clock today to stop it. So that's when we ran legislation. And you gotta be responsible because we are talking about alcohol. And we got it passed and it's still very, very popular by our patrons. So as we move forward, we wanted to make sure that we did so in a very, very responsible way, but also where we weren't trying to hurt or harm other industries like bars and, and the like. And I think we got there. I think it's all about compromise. But we did actually, I think, bring about a, a good opportunity and patrons love it. Now, an outgrowth of that has been third-party delivery companies. How do we stop the Uber driver from taking a sip of your margarita before you get it? 
right? How do we stop a grown adult from embellishing or enjoying their beverage before they get home? So we have seals on it. We have to do certain things, tape down straws to ensure that we're being responsible and we're not putting anyone in harm's way. Labor, as you know, is one of the probably the most difficult things we are seeing right now. And we had three basically different buckets when COVID hit of what happened to our employees. Some left and said, we want to go into something else because we want to get, if this ever happens again, we want to make sure we're getting paid. Another group decided to go back to school or better their education, bless you. Another group decided to move out of state or go home, care for a loved one, or just move into something completely different. Minimum wage has gone up enormously over the years. It ha also has mandates as well. Predictive scheduling, a lot of things that may seem unfair to the employee, but really makes it difficult for the employee and the employer to coexist. So we have this referral that's going to say, we need some kind of uniformity across cities, across our, our state, to ensure that we can have some kind of uniformity that will allow us to run our restaurants. So let me give you an example. If I've got a manager that works at a wildflower bread company in Chandler, and then has to go work in Mesa, and then has to go work in Tempe all in the same day, how do you manage that time sheet if they're not a salaried employee? So you're gonna hear more about this as we get into uh, the election season uh, in that, uh, and how that helps not only restaurants, but our industry. Right now, there's a dishwasher for a well-known steakhouse in the state making $24 an hour. Our labor has just skyrocketed. What are we doing? I just came back from Chicago from our the streets charging 18 or 15. So when you see some restaurants not even increasing their prices at all, which has got to be less than 1%, that means they have it so tightly wound, meaning maybe they own their building so they don't pay rent, or their supply chain issues are so good. I mean, that's very uncommon during what we just experienced to not raise your prices. And, and so they have to have all those seats dialed in so well and a smaller staff that they didn't have to increase prices. Some have had to go, they have gone too high and had to, to, to do pullback. So look, gas is gonna cost what it costs, but you have an alternative when it comes to restaurants and dining on what you want to pay and who's charging it. So that's why I say we're not going to be able to pass all the costs on through increasing menu pricing because it could put you out of business. But mean? COVID has also, we have another question, two questions here. COVID's also made restaurants um, in some cases more efficient. So for instance, instead of going to print with all your menus every so months, every so many months, there, you know, you're seeing more QR codes and those kinds of things that will link you to it. So they have gotten some efficiencies and some positive things out Absolutely. of that. Absolutely. Hey Steve, question. Are you guys at the Arizona Restaurant Association doing anything with the third party vendors like DoorDash, Grubhub, and those guys? Because they're taking almost 40% of our, our ticket, number one. Number two, they're also taking our staff, right? Because now they're these guys are making 25, 30 bucks an hour to run DoorDash delivery. And they're not feeling the impact of the brakes you gotta change and the tires you gotta change yet, but it's good, it's coming. And I'm seeing more applications come through now this past couple of weeks. But are you guys doing anything to, or is anybody doing anything with those guys? Cause they're just, they're, they're, they're like discounting products without letting us know. So you, know, you look at your, in your uh, statement at the end of the month, you've given back so much of promotional stuff that you didn't even sign up for. You know, or giving a customer calls in and says, hey, I didn't receive this. And they're taking that out of our pocket. We have the drivers eating the lunch, right? You know, so I don't know. Are you guys doing anything with them at all? You know, it's uh, you're you're touching a sore subject for me personally, right? Because because I I fight for my restaurateurs, or else I wouldn't be doing this job for 20 years, right? And and you're at a competitive disadvantage if you don't sign up with them. And I had DoorDash, and I'll say them by name hijack one of my members menus in Scottsdale when they first came here and put it on their website without even telling the restaurateur. And we had to send them a cease and desist letter. I've got a problem with Open Table and I've got a problem with some of these third-party delivery companies. Now, Open Table has come to reason that they're not the only kid in town anymore and that they have to be more affordable. And that's why they sponsor Restaurant Week because it's a fraction of the price of what they get paid by a restaurant during Restaurant Week. Uh, because keep in mind, you're talking about a three-course meal for $33, $44, or $55, and sometimes that includes alcohol. 
So when you had these third party delivery companies in their early years start here in Arizona, I think they were way out of line in some of the tactics they were using and we put a stop to it. The problem is the consumer wants it and you have to pay for it or else you're not going to be competitive as a restaurateur. The problem I have is liability always comes back on the restaurant. The liability of the guy who's caught on camera taking a slice of pizza and eating it or drinking a kid's milkshake before they open the door, and this is all caught on tape, is real. But there is nothing, it always comes back. If the food isn't right, you're not going to call the, the third party delivery company. You're going to call the restaurant. And so we actually are getting ready to run legislation and we're working with them because the same issue is on the legalities and liability of alcohol delivery, right? Uh, to make sure that they're not handing it to a seven, seven year old kid uh, and, and making sure. So it's been very challenging. I will say it's getting far better. They're, they're more reasonable now because I think they're realizing they need us and restaurants as well. But I believe right now there's an inequity between the restaurant and the third party delivery companies as who's responsible at the end of the day uh, for that food getting there in a safe and an enjoyable format. Because nine times out of 10, the kickback and chargeback comes to the restaurant, not the third party delivery company. All right, one more question here, Steve. Hey Steve, um, I had a question about, uh, I'm in the sign company or sign business. So we watched a lot of takedowns of different businesses, including restaurants. We've also seen a lot of these new restaurants open. My question is, has there been with all the difficulties, knowing there's these difficulties, staff, labor, everything, have there been incentives for the restaurants to open? Yeah, and, and hello to your mom and dad family. Her dad was my boss and I was 16 years old at my family's <laughs> dealership, he was the general manager. Um, but don't tell them the stories. Okay. So the, uh, the reality is this, and, and this is, I would have lost thousands of dollars if I made a bet or bets on how the restaurant industry will recover in 2021. I told you we lost a thousand restaurants in 2020. We made all of them up in 2021 and then some. Wow. 250 people moved to Maricopa County a day. Fastest growing county in America for the fifth consecutive year. So to your question more specifically, restaurants, Spinatos, had restaurants already in the pipeline. They said, why would we not open? We have no choice, right? We've already spent the money. A lot of restaurants in the pipeline were already set to open. Drive throughs became gold and crystal and diamonds all wrapped up into one. If you had a drive through, that was, that was huge for you because of just how many people you could push through. So a lot of the reason why we had such a, a quick, I think, uh, rapid snap response uh, in the positive for restaurants is so many were in the pipeline and so many people are moving to the state of Arizona to Chandler that they have to eat. You got to live somewhere, you got to work somewhere, and you got to eat. And that third component is what's kept restaurants, I think, really, really thriving. Wow, such great information. Thank you, Steve. Um, and I wanna thank also those of you that are online and being patient with that. I know that everybody um, has mentioned Mafang a couple of times today, but I wanna do a personal shout out. They have Mingle and Grace in downtown Chandler has been named as our micro business of the year, and we're gonna celebrate them next week. So congratulations on that. So lots of information. Steve has a number of data points and so forth. You want to learn more, come up and talk to him. But um, he, he's doing some great work and I appreciate that advocacy. The other third party that we're going to have to work with are these um, social media and um, how people, if they get upset because of wait staff or wait yep. times, yep. the Yelps and those kinds of things and um, it could ruin businesses. So we need to talk about that. But I wanna do a shout out and thank you, number one, to um, all of our presenting sponsors, um, what SRP, um, Alliance Bank of Arizona, Dignity Health Chandler Regional Medical Center, Intel, Catalyst Computer, Alliance Bank of Arizona, Wells Fargo, and SRP. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for those of you that are online joining us. Um, we really appreciate this. Lots of great information. Stay tuned um, and visit the Chamber website to see our next um, event coming up. Have a great day.